Hey everybody, it's Retro DM Ray. Hey, uh, back from vacation and back from uh, some time away uh, to kind of get a little bit of focus back on the channel and kind of finish up our book, um, the Role Playing Game Primer and Old School Playbook. Um, so we're going to pick up right where we left off last time and kind of finish that off today. And then at the end of that, I'll tell you a little bit of stuff about what's to come. Um, again, if you like this content, if you like the channel, please like and subscribe and click that bell icon to be notified when we upload new videos. Um, remember to check the uh, description of the video down below uh, where you can find it. PayPal me to support me if you'd like to do that and make a donation to me and the family. Um, you can check out my Patreon um, where we're trying to get together a uh, play-by-post uh, West Marsh's hex crawl style basic fantasy game. Um, if you would like to enjoy something like that, um, and other things in the description as well. Um, so let's get started. Um, on page 51, at the bottom of page 50, we've been talking about railroading, and we've been talking about, um, not abusing GM fiat and forcing the adventure back on track. And we've been talking about also not needing to write a story. In the old school story, it's what happens when your players pick up their dice and walk into the world. So now we're at the top of page 51, where this section is titled, Be a Little Random. Many game masters will tell you of the importance of having a good dungeon ecology. The idea is that your dungeon and all the monsters in it should make sense, based on the location of the dungeon and the way in which it was built and populated. Randomly stocking the dungeon the way we did in Part 4 is a no-no to these GMs. I'm here to tell you that the real world often seems pretty random. I recall an old school building where the third floor restrooms were like handball courts. A few toilets lined up along one wall, sinks on another, and a bunch of empty space. I think they were converted classrooms. In another building, a staircase goes up to a blank wall where a doorway was closed off sometime in the past. The point is, life is messy. Plans get changed. Items get repurposed. Sometimes you end up with some pretty weird neighbors. Well... The true believer in dungeon ecology would say, then you need to think about that too. When you design a dungeon, think about all the different creatures that lived there and how they would have changed or expanded the dungeon. Consider this. Any dungeon design of this sort, put together with all that deep thinking, which is hidden from the players, of course, will look pretty random in the end. So go with the flow. Roll up your rooms randomly, and then go through design with your map in front of you and think about what parts are pure nonsense. Don't sweat every detail. But do try to avoid sticking full-grown dragons in 10 by 10 square rooms. Rearrange the rooms, as I did in part 4, to suit your needs. If a room rolled randomly just doesn't work, throw it out and create a new version. Randomly, or not as it suits you. Sometimes you'll start with an idea for part of a dungeon, and that's great. You don't have to roll every room randomly. Let the dice be your servants, not your master. You can still use them to fill in the rooms you don't have a plan for. There's another good reason to use random rolls to create at least part of your dungeon design, and I'll talk about that next. Try not to develop a pattern. Adventure writing is like any other form of writing in many ways. For instance, every writer has a style, and with experience you can recognize it. Style shows not only the words the author chooses, but also the concepts and philosophies he or she promotes. Really, there's nothing wrong with having a style, but it's important to avoid letting your style make you too predictable, especially if it's an adventure you're writing. I don't know how many times in discussions, held in person or online, that a GM has said, I don't use Monster X because I don't like it. Sometimes it's a game mechanical thing. Sometimes it's more a factor of the monster's imaginary ecology or role or backstory. So the GM whose existence we are imagining creates a new adventure for his or her group of regular players. They all know their GM's style well, naturally. In the course of the adventure, an NPC hints at the presence of a vampire, for instance, and all the players think, nah, our GM doesn't like vampires, and they don't even take that seriously. I've also heard many GMs say that they never use adventure modules. That's too bad, really, because using an adventure module written by another author is one of the easiest ways to avoid or break up your patterns. Oh sure, you may still go through and change some things you really don't like. The overall adventure will still be in the author's style instead of in yours. Another, harder way is to create NPCs who hold beliefs that disagree with yours, and then don't let them be just cardboard cutouts. Do some reading. Read things people 
read things written by people you don't agree with. And remember, in any reasonably large and expansive fantasy world, there should be at least a few people, or dragons or whatever, who believe just like that. Stretch a bit. Use the monsters you usually don't like, or which for some reason you've just omitted. I hardly ever use giants, a weakness I'm trying to overcome. It's not that I dislike giants, I just never think of them when I'm choosing monsters. So recently I ran some of J.D. Neal's Saga of the Giants adventures, as a way to overcome that weak point and surprise my players. The point is, don't let yourself fall into a rut. Breaking your patterns will keep your game fresh for your players, and for you as well. Scene Building Shorthand I'm a proponent of the fast and loose method of campaign world development. The more you write down, the more things you create that your players will never see or appreciate. Look at the classics of sword and sorcery fiction. They use a variety of shortcuts to make the world seem real, or at least interesting, without actually providing or needing a lot of deep background material. It's not swords and sorcery, but here's one of my favorite examples. The man in black fled across the desert, and the gunslinger followed. You just read that, and now you can see it in your mind's eye. I don't know if the two men named, I'm 95% certain you imagine the gunslinger as a man, are on horseback, in your imagination, just like they are in mine, but you can see the desert, and the man in black, and the gunslinger dressed in tanned clothing, rather like Marshall Dillon or maybe Clint Eastwood. If you don't imagine it exactly as I do, I bet you still have a vivid image. If you don't recognize it, that's the first line of the first Dark Tower book by Stephen King titled The Gunslinger. You don't need a deep description of the world to make it seem real and interesting to the players. Don't be afraid of stereotypes. They are the shorthand of the imagination. You can set a scene very quickly by using stereotypical descriptions. Then, as the scene unfolds, the players will realize those were just their first impressions. Stereotypes are only bad story-wise when they trap you, when you let each and every character be only a stereotype with no depth at all. The same things that work with characters work with worlds. If an NPC swears, by the seven swords of Saviar, you know there's a story there. It doesn't have to be heavily detailed, but it can lead to an adventure if you play it right. It worked quite well for me. The secret is not to show everything or tell everything. Keeping some mystery in your storytelling is important. And if you're going to do that, don't bother writing down in detail 1,000 or 2,000 or 10,000 years of your campaign world history. You won't remember it all, and if you do, you'll likely never have an opportunity for your players to ever appreciate it. Keep it short, just notes to remind you of the main parts. After all, people in the real world don't really know history nearly as well as they'd like to think. Why should it be different in the campaign world? So you, in the guise of an NPC, tell the players about the defeat of the great clan of Cenarius, and later another P NPC tells a contradictory story. Even if it is, in fact, you who have remembered wrong or otherwise screwed up, why worry about it? Make it part of your world. Using miniatures. You can play role-playing games just fine without the use of any board or playing pieces. I did that way for years, but there are many advantages to the use of miniature figures. There are two main ways to use miniatures. First, you can use a battle mat or other gridded mat or board. The second way is to use a blank surface such as a table and a ruler. With a battle mat and a set of wet erase markers, I can lay out a room in which a battle is about to happen or some other interesting event is likely. I instruct my players to place their figures on the mat using the squares at some scale. Generally, one square equals five feet, though I've used ten-foot squares on occasion. And when the encounter happens, I place my monster figures in the appropriate place on the map or on the mat. The squares make it easy to figure out movement, so as we count through the initiative numbers, each player moves his or her figure as desired. Using a blank surface and a ruler is really much the same thing. Generally, you will define scale distances of 1 inch equals 5 or 10 feet, much as the same as with a battle mat. Using the battle mat makes it easier to draw out dungeon rooms, using the grid lines as a guide, but there is really little difference otherwise. If you choose to use a battle mat, you'll notice that diagonal movement can't just count squares. A square is about 1.4 times as wide diagonally as the length of a side. I suggest you count every second diagonal step as being two steps. This will give an average distance of 1.5 squares per diagonal step, which is, I think, plenty close enough for a game. Miniatures are handy for other purposes as well. For example, when the adventurers enter the dungeon, you will probably need them to declare their marching order so you can tell who steps into a trap first or who's targeted first by monsters attacking from the front or the rear. Without figures, you have to write it down. With figures, the player can just line them up and you can see at a glance what their marching order is. Miniatures can become expensive. For some, they're almost an addiction. If you have limited cash available, please note that cardboard stand-up figures are available for purchase or even as free downloads, which you can print yourself. Some monster encounters are hard or 
possibly even impossible to play out on the battle net. Consider as an example an insect swarm or a flock of bats. Don't feel that because you and your players have miniatures. You have to use them for every or any particular monster encounter. Part 6. Other Games So far this book has described role-playing games using examples from the basic fantasy RPG. But BFRPG is hardly the only RPG system in the world. There are many, many others you could choose from. Basic Fantasy RPG is a class and level game system. Each character has a class, which defines the sort of things he or she can do or not do, and a level of experience which determines how well. There are quite a lot of these game systems, but there are also many that use other methods of resolution. The opposite, if that word means anything, of a class and level game is a skills-based game. In those games, each player chooses, in some way or another, skills his or her character knows how to do. Fight, cast spells, ride horses, make armor, and so on, and assign some rank or chance of success. Thus, it's entirely possible to create a character who is really good at fighting, but can also sneak around, or one who knows how to work magic and train animals, or whatever else the player can think of. Those who are fans of such games will tell you that they are superior. Personally, to me, superior means more fun, and thus is entirely only a matter of taste. There are also games which straddle the line, granting skills as a result of gaining levels or allowing players to choose to add skills instead of gaining levels, or even both. Note that the old versus new school discussion crosses over these types of games. There are certainly examples of all types of games in each school. Assuming you choose to play an old school class and level game, you'll have many options. Most of these games are called retro clones because they mimic one or another of the classic games from the early days of RPGs. Besides Basic Fantasy RPG, I'm going to discuss three other very good options in the sections below and talk a little bit about these adventures designed for any of them in any of the others. The first one is Osric. Osric, or the Old School Reference and Index Compilation, is a game system which mimics the advanced rules from the 70s and 80s. It is well known and fairly popular and is one of the oldest retro clone game systems. Next is Labyrinth Lord by Goblinoid Games and is a game system which mimics the 1981 basic version of the world's most popular RPG. Goblinoid Games also offers the Advanced Edition Companion, which, when used with Labyrinth Lord, gives an advanced game experience. Swords and Wizardry by Mythmere Games is actually three games. The Core Rules, which mimics the 74 version of the world's most popular RPG, with the most popular supplement, the Complete Rules which incorporates all the early supplementary rules and the white box rules, which mimics just the very first three-book version of that same game. Swords and Wizardry is the least detailed, indeed vaguest, according to the official website, set of rules in this group, but this vagueness is actually considered an advantage. The GM is not just free, but indeed is encouraged to interpret a great many rules as he or she sees fit. So which should I choose? Well, that's a tough question, but here's the good news. All of the games discussed here, including Basic Fantasy RPG, are available as free PDF documents on the publishers' respective websites. BasicFantasy.org, Knights-N-Naves.com, slash Osric, GoblinoidGames.com, MythmereGames.com. And the Knight and Knave, by the way, is with a K. So go download them, give them a read, and see which one appeals to you most. But read on for more information that might help you decide. What about converting game materials? All four games discussed here are actually very compatible, especially at lower levels. There are a few details you'll need to know if you want to use adventures written for one in another. Probably the first thing you'll notice is that each game approaches armor class differently. Recall that in Basic Fantasy RPG, AC starts at 11 for an unarmored man and goes up from there. This is an ascending AC system. In Labyrinth Lord, the game that is the most similar to BFRPG otherwise, AC starts at 9 for an unarmored man and goes down from there. This is called a descending armor class system. Osric uses a descending AC system which is almost just like Labyrinth Lord. It gives an unarmored man an AC of 10 and descends from there. If you use an adventure written for either in the other rule system, you just use the AC the way it's written unless you're dealing with an unarmored character. Swords and Wizardry uses both systems. Armor class is given using a descending system which starts at 9 for unarmored and goes down, just like Labyrinth Lord, and also using ascending numbers which start at 10 for unarmored and go up, almost but not quite exactly like Basic Fantasy RPG which starts unarmored characters at AC 11. Sounds confusing, I know, but it's actually pretty easy to switch between them and play. If converting descending AC to ascending, 
any descending AC to basic fantasy RPG AC, for example, deduct the armor class from 20. If converting basic fantasy AC to descending, or any of the other games, deduct it from 20. It works in both directions. To convert ascending EC, AC between BFRPG and Swords and Wizardry, deduct one point from basic fantasy RPG to Swords and Wizardry, or add one point going from Swords and Wizardry to basic fantasy. You can almost always tell how to do it by looking at the three classic armor types, leather, chainmail, and plate mail. Take a look at this table, which is on page 59. Armor type, leather armor, descending armor class is 7. BFRPG, 13. Swords and Wizardry, ascending, 12. Chainmail, descending, 5. BFRPG, 15. Swords and Wizardry, ascending, 14. Plate mail, 3. BFRPG, 17. Swords and Wizardry, ascending, 16. This tells the whole story. The descending column gives the numbers for Labyrinth Lord, Osric, and Swords and Wizardry, the last in descending format. The BFRPG column gives the AC in the ascending format for Basic Fantasy RPG, and the Swords and Wizardry ascending column gives the same for Swords and Wizardry. And almost all retro clones, the armor classes of these three armor types will be equivalent, so you can use them to figure out the conversion for yourself. Movement. Unfortunately, all four games represent movement differently, yet all four can be readily converted, as I'll explain below. Recall that Basic Fantasy RPG movement rates are given in a per-round fashion. Unarmored characters move 40 feet per round. In Labyrinth Lord, movement is given in feet per turn, and then in parentheses, in feet per round. In that game, an unarmored character moves 120 feet, 40 feet per round. Note that the per-round movement rate is the same for both games. If converting from BFRPG to Labyrinth Lord, the GM could simply multiply the BFRPG movement rate by 3 to get the per-turn movement rate for Labyrinth Lord. Obviously, converting from Labyrinth Lord to BFRPG is trivial, since the number you need is right there in parentheses. And by the way, that's how we converted movement rate in 2nd edition and even in 1st edition as well. You just took that, multiplied the 12 inches by 10 to get feet, and then divided by 3 to get feet per round. Same way we did it back then. Um, Osric presents movement as a number of feet per round. However, Osric's rounds are longer than rounds in either of the other two games. An unarmored character in Osric has a movement rate of 120 feet per round, which rather conveniently is the same as the per turn rate in Labyrinth Lord. Simply divide this number by 3 to get the per-round rate for either BFRPG or Labyrinth Lord. Swords and Wizardry presents movement rate as a number of scale inches. Unarmored characters have a movement rate of 12 scale inches per turn, which translates to 120 feet out indoors at the indoor scale rate of 1 inch equals 10 feet. No, note, once again, the equivalence. The per-turn rate in Swords and Wizardry is equivalent, at least indoors, to the per-turn rate in Labyrinth Lord. So to convert Swords and Wizardry movement rates to Labyrinth Lord, just multiply the given number by 10 feet, and to convert to Basic Fantasy RPG, multiply by 10, and then divide by 3. The handy chart illustrates the, the thing below on page 60. Basic Fantasy, 80 feet. Labyrinth Lord, 240 feet, 80 feet per round. Osric, 240 feet. Swords and Wizardry, 24 and the bottom of the chart is Basic Fantasy 10 foot, Labyrinth Lord 30 feet, 10 foot per round, Osric 30 feet, and Swords and Wizardry 3. You can extrapolate your numbers from there pretty easily. Morale. Basic Fantasy RPG and Labyrinth Lord use almost identical morale rolls on 2d6. You can use the morale number from either game with the other pretty freely. Osric employs a percentile morale roll. The table following can be used to select an appropriate conversion between the 2d6 and percentile morale systems. 2d6, 2 equals 3%, 3 equals 8%, 4 is 17, 5 is 28, 6 is 42, 7 is 58, 8 is 72, 9 is 83, 10 is 92, 11 is 97, and 12 is 100. When converting from Osric to either of the 2d6 games, read down the percent column until you get to the first number that is equal to or higher than the Osric percent, then read across to the 2d6 number. Going in the other direction is a bit more obvious. Swords and Wizardry has a morale system very different from either of the 
seating systems. When converting to Swords and Wizardry from another system, the GM will have to decide for himself or herself whether to apply the other system's morale or not. When converting to another game from Swords and Wizardry, the GM must make up the morale however he or she sees fit. I suggest reviewing similar monsters in the other game's rulebook and assigning a similar morale figure. And I would suggest, actually, um, you can either use uh, first edition uh, DMG's morale system, or you can use uh, second edition's D20-based morale system, both of which are pretty easy. Um, and all the monsters in the Monstrous Manual for second edition have morale rating. Um, the monsters in first edition Monster Manual have the same. <clears throat> Alignment. The alignment of a character or creature is a general description of its beliefs. The very earliest RPGs used a simple alignment system of lawful, neutral, or chaotic. Both Labyrinth Lord and Swords and Wizardry used similar systems. More advanced games added a second axis of good, neutral, or evil, which combines with the first axis to create nine distinct alignments, such as lawful good or chaotic neutral. Osric uses a version of this system. Basic Fantasy RPG does not use any alignment system, though there are alignment supplements available on the basicfantasy.org website. When converting monsters between these systems, the GM should consider monsters with similar outlooks in his or her chosen rules and assign the same alignment to the converted monster. Of course, if converting to basic fantasy RPG, you can simply ignore whatever alignment is already assigned. And may I tell you, for my personal games, um, alignment is a, a big deal for me. Um, lawful, Neutral, and Chaotic is the easiest one to use. Um, I also use the nine distinct ones uh, for second edition as well. Um, because I do believe that paladins um, really matter in their alignment, and I also believe that clerics and druids really matter in their alignment as well. Um, so that's just me. Other statistics. Amazingly, most of the other statistics are roughly equivalent for all three games. In general, you should look up name spells, monsters, and magic items you find in an adventure in your chosen game's rulebook and verify that they are actually equivalent. When you don't find equivalents, you'll have to make adjustments. And I would argue that uh, you can cross between 2nd edition, 1st edition, basic fantasy RPG, and all these other games that are mentioned and swap those spells out pretty easily. Um, the... Uh, uh, magic guides, uh, the, the wizard spell compendiums and the priest spell compendiums from second edition would be a great way to have just a humongous amount of spells um, to be able to cross back and forth between the editions, um, as well as Libra Magica, which is a download from uh, BFRPG website, um, has got a ton of spells on there as well, more than just in the BFRPG rulebook. So you might consider looking at that supplement as well. Um, afterward, well, you've made it to the end. If you haven't already, grab a copy of whichever game has caught your fancy, round up some friends, and jump in. All the games I've talked about have vibrant communities of fans in various parts of the internet. If they have any sense, they'll be happy to see you. I know if you join us on the Basic Fantasy RPG forums, you'll be made welcome. If you aren't able to put together a group of friends to play, consider joining a play-by-post or chat game online. A play-by-post game tends to move slower, since the GM must wait for all players to check in before resolving actions. And the players will make, wait for the GM to do it, of course. But if you're busy, or very busy, a play-by-post might be just what you need to get your feet wet. And I would argue wholeheartedly in that direction. Um, come and check out my Patreon um, for an idea already to uh, get started on a play-by-post with me. Um, I'll be glad to have any and all comers. It's West Marches um, and hex crawl style. You can do a Google search on that stuff and find all kinds of cool videos about that. Matt Coville and others have talked about that. Um, there is a hex crawl companion on the BFRPG website. Um, I use all that cool stuff to, to put together a cool West Marches game where um, you players are in control of where you want to go scout around and adventure around and, um, and tell some stories in. So I would encourage you to do that like he does. Um, chat games are much more immediate, he says, obviously, and many of them use online tabletop sites, which provide a virtual battle mat and figures. You will need a reliable internet connection to play a chat game, naturally. Some chat games are text chat, where you type what you want to say, while others use shared audio, so you can talk to the GM and the other players. Whatever you choose, it's my sincere hope that this book has helped you prepare. But now, it's time. Get in the game, and good luck. Chris Connerman. All right, well, I hope you guys have really enjoyed this book. As I said, I've read this several times. 
um, as well as reading it through here with you. I've enjoyed going back through it again, just reminding me of some old things. Um, I really do hope that it has primed your imagination. It has primed your your mind and your heart to uh, to really want to get into this um, OSR. Um, I think it's the best place to be, really, uh, all the possible gaming. I think there's absolutely no reason, um, for me and my family at least personally, to do any of the new modern systems. But hey, like I say on my channel, whatever your gaming thing is, is your thing, that's your thing. You're having fun, that's fine. Go do that. Go have some fun with your friends, tell some cool stories, uh, roll some dice. That's the important thing. Um, but for me and my group, it's it's old school stuff. It's where the paper isn't the thing that you play. It's you that play, and there's just a few things on the paper. Um, I just really think that uh, that's really the way a good role-playing game kind of plays out. Um, now, um, I appreciate you tuning in for all of this time and following along with my um, perhaps poor uh, audiobook reading of that book for you. Um, but uh, I just want to tell you about some future stuff that's coming. Um, if you saw one of my shorts recently, you saw um, some different pictures flash along the screen. Um, those are things that we use to combine together to do our own home game. Um, one of our own home games, um, we kind of call, um, kind of call it our crazy tile adventures, um, where it's a chance for me as the to DM to kind of step back and I get to be a player with my wife and three kids all around the table. And so we're all kind of playing together. So it's almost board game style. Um, so if I can figure out the best free way to do a table down shot, I can show you those things and show you kind of how I go through and combine those together. If I can't figure out a free way to be able to do that, um, rest assured, what I will do is post some pictures of uh, the different things that I use laid out and uh, kind of some of the pictures of the tables that I use to lay them out. And I'll talk you through um, how I do that with us so that you'll kind of be able to understand. Um, really, it's an interesting beast. Um, but to be able to step away from DMing and to get to play is just um, really something that I look forward to occasionally. I am a dungeon master at heart, but occasionally I do like to be able to step away and play. Um, I'm not much of an online playing guy. Um, I'm not much of a Roll20 and those kinds of uh, virtual tabletop kind of a guy. I've played a couple of those and the audio skipping back and forth and cutting in and out and all those kinds of things. That's all just kind of a mess. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, I much prefer playing in person um, or, uh, like I said, playing by post. Um, so I would really encourage you to uh, to check out my Patreon. It's really, really cheap every month to become a part of that. Um, once I get some patrons starting to come, then I can start posting some, some personally created stuff that you can take a look at and download for yourself um, as we get going up on that and get some patrons on there. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. Um, as I said, I would encourage you, if you want to donate to me and my family, um, feel free to do that in the PayPal link below. As well as uh, if you want to pick up anything from Drive Through RPG, you'd like me to take a look at it. Um, I am talking with uh, a person online to be able to review one of their products here soon, and I'm kind of excited about that and getting to share that with you. That I think is a great, um, a great D and D gaming, um, a tool that you can use in system that's pretty cool um, to add into your games as well. Um, so I'm hoping that that works out. Um, Another, time, another channel I will tell you about that I would like to suggest to you is a, story, a channel called Storytime with Jester. I recently checked a guy out. He's got a lot of cool old school stuff. Um, he wrote a really cool book. Um, I'm picking that up. And uh, he reads through a lot of it on his channel too. Uh, seems like a really great guy. Um, I know I've talked with him a while on Facebook and I can tell you that he's a pretty cool guy. Really good old school gamer. You really ought to check out his channel. Um, again, Thanks and shout out to DM James for his shout out to me recently and for Rob's game group, um, for Bandit's Keep, um, for Unscripted and Unchained and uh, others, channels that I've been to that I may have missed on here that you're subscribed to me. Um, I really just appreciate you guys um, and thank you so much for all of your content too. Again, my content's always G-rated, always family-friendly, always will be non-political, non-social commentary, non-cultural cancel junk, and all that mess that's going on in our world today. I'm just all about the cool, old-school gaming, 
um, and pushing that forward and training up others to do the same. So I hope that's something that you like. And uh, like I say at the end of all of my videos, um, first of all, thanks again, guys. And uh, hey, may all of your roles be nat 20s. Take care. Bye.